evidence for the basic accuracy of the gospel accounts of the resurrection is the fact that the testimony is given by women. That's not because women are more trustworthy than men. It's simply that unless it were absolutely true, the men who wrote the gospels would never have said so. Saying so damaged their case. In the society in which Jesus and his disciples lived, women were not allowed to give testimony as equals of men. So, legally speaking, the church had no basis for believing in the resurrection. The witnesses were not qualified to give testimony. The example of divorce in Mark's Gospel is another case of women being treated differently from men. A husband could abuse his wife, deprive her, and use her, but she had no means of escape. A woman did not have the ability to divorce her husband. Mark's mention of a woman divorcing is something he added to the words of Jesus out of his own Gentile background. Jewish women could not divorce their husbands. The right of divorce belonged to the man, and no legal proceedings were required. A woman could be made homeless and deprived of her children and all support on the whim of her husband. One rabbi taught that a burnt meal was sufficient grounds for divorce. There was another group in the time of Jesus that lacked basic rights, children. Children were possessions. In Roman law, a father who killed his child faced no legal penalty. Children are still abused by adults throughout the world. They labor in dangerous conditions. They're forced into sexual slavery. They're provided with entertainment that poisons their minds and spirits. They're aborted, deprived of education, forced to live in inhuman conditions, victimized by war and poverty, and physically and emotionally abused. Jesus defended two groups in his society that had no defense. He forbade discarding wives or denying children a right to a place among his followers. There is no toleration in the reign of God for the bias that infected his society and infects our own. People who differ from some social or personal norm in race, nationality, social class, religion, age, physical abilities, education, sexual orientation, language, tastes, employment, or lack of it, or just about anything else, are frequently ignored, deprived, and even abused. Women and children still experience this. Others include refugees and migrants, persons with AIDS, the disabled, and racial, ethnic, and religious minorities. The reign of God is as big as eternity, but it has no room for discrimination. Discrimination is a terrible sin because it denies creation. The truth that God made the world in love is not threatened by science. It's denied by those who treat others as if they were not children of God's loving creation. Jesus was angry when he saw his disciples discriminate. Dare we assume that his anger is any less when we do it? What are we to do? The first step in conversion is to recognize our sinfulness. I must examine my life and my attitudes. I must pay attention when I meet see or hear about someone different from myself? Do I judge others by criteria other than their being sons and daughters of God? Following the admission of sin, there's contrition. I must pray for a heart that is pained by my sin. Then there's confession. This is true in the sacrament. Have I ever thought to confess my bias? And in my day-to-day -day life, I must confess to others and myself that I am capable of discrimination, that I fall into the sin. Confession to myself is important because it is the source of amendment. I must pray for courage to turn from sin, to cooperate with God's call to change my life. That's not easy when the sin is one I may have inherited from my community, family, or society. Finally, there is penance action to heal the damage caused by sin. I must act to bring an end to anything that denies the children of God their full dignity. To do less is to decide that God's reign should exclude certain people. 
Perhaps it can. But in that case, we may find that the ones who are excluded are we.